Welcome to the Opportunity Podcast, where entrepreneurs come to learn from real buyers, sellers, and industry experts on the lesser known growth opportunities to build their online business empires. We'll uncover tactics veteran online business entrepreneurs have used to build, buy, flip, and sell their way towards personal wealth. Sit back, grab a coffee, and get ready to uncover hidden growth secrets. The Opportunity Podcast starts now. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Opportunity Podcast, your go-to resource for hidden growth opportunities throughout online business. For those familiar new to the podcast, I'm Sarah, and thanks for joining me today. In this episode, I'll be talking to Yoni Mazur, CGO and co-founder of Gatita. Gatita provides sellers with auditing software that helps keep track of Amazon FBA inventory transactions, refunds, seller data analytics, and FBA reimbursements easily and clearly. Yoni's mission is to help sellers get money they're rightfully entitled to, but often have no idea they're able to claim back from Amazon. He explains the instances in which sellers are able to claim reimbursements from Amazon and the step-by-step process of how it's done. We also explore the long-lasting effects of being able to properly audit your Amazon business and how to translate it to more than just money in your pocket. This is a great episode for everyone looking to not leave cash on the table with their Amazon business. So you ready to get your money back? Let's get started to find out how. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Opportunity Podcast. I'm really excited to be back with you guys today. Today's guest, Yoni Mizor from Gatita, is on with us. So, Yoni, how you doing? Where are you calling in from in the world? I'm in Teaneck, New Jersey. I'm about 10 minutes away from New York City. You know, we're recording this, I guess, February. Weather here is kind of dicey, choppy, still snow and white outside. But I guess I can't complain. Changing seasons is, uh, I guess, a blessed thing in this area. Yeah, you guys just got hit with like, I mean, of course, just watching the news, some crazy ice vortex storm. You guys were just like shut down a week ago or something like that, right? Yeah, it's like the Game of Thrones. I don't know if you remember that there was like the ice area, like the, yeah. the frozen area. So it was kind of like that here for a little while. Yeah. Oof, man, more power to you. I, being from Virginia and just kind of traveling to warmer areas, I don't think I've got my bones to handle the cold. So <laughs> if you've got that strength, like great for you. <laughs> I'll be, I'll I'll share with, I hope nobody's listening, but was in Florida at the same time. So (laughs) I kind of rescued myself. So the legend says it looked like that. It definitely looked like that when I came back from Florida, it was all like white and snowed. So I saw the the aftermath. Okay, good. So you didn't have to get stuck in that. Fair play. Good job being in Florida. (laughs) Hopefully having, (laughs) thank you, Florida. Very cool. So, you know, it's our first time having you on the show. It's really great to have you on. So best place to probably kick off is a little bit of your background and your journey. So for those who don't know you, tell us a little bit about your entrepreneurial journey and what it looks like today. You got it. So currently I'm the co-founder and chief growth officer of uh, Gatita. I'll say a little bit about Gatita and basically the evolution, how I got to Gatita. Hopefully that will cover, I guess, the background experience. So Gatita, we're essentially a technology company and our focus is helping e-commerce sellers, you know, predominantly Amazon sellers, get the maximum FBA recoveries or reimbursements that they're eligible to receive. We do through uh, data, you know, data analytics, but also we have a dedicated team that, you know, services the issues and helps seller get, you know, everything they kind of owed. That's kind of in our core mission and purpose. We audit billions of dollars worth of transactions every single day across our network for our users. And we have a team of over 100 people in six countries, a global team. And we operate on a global levels because we service Amazon sellers based that are selling in the U.S., but also Canada, Mexico, UK, and EU. That's kind of the touch of things. Gatita was actually born from our activities. When I sing ours, I'm my, my partner till today, Max Boren, as retailers. About a decade ago, we started selling online. The main platform back in the day was eBay. So we started selling on eBay and on the side, he was actually doing like accounting work and I was doing sales and distribution for a supplement company in those times. And then it kind of started picking up, you know, selling online. And then around 2013, I believe, we started selling on Amazon. And the business grew very quickly from zero to 20 million in annual sales. And then we became a part of a larger group that together as a group, we're generating about $100 million a year in revenue. And what happened was we utilized Amazon's FBA, which also known as Fulfillment by Amazon program. Essentially that program, you know, for the ones listening are not too familiar, when you sell on Amazon, you have two options. You can have your own warehouse and when the orders come in from the marketplace, you fulfill your own orders. 
or you ship your inventory to Amazon's fulfillment centers. They receive it, they store it, and as the orders come in, they fulfill it, hence fulfilled by Amazon. So most of our sales were FBA sales fulfilled by Amazon. And what happened was we constantly found discrepancies with all the inventory, the massive amount of volume that we were sending to Amazon. It came to a point where we had so much volume coming in in terms of data, because to reconcile, you need to download a lot of data from Amazon Seller Central and all these reports, and it was simply breaking our spreadsheets. So that pushed us to do kind of two things. First thing was to develop technology to help us constantly audit the massive amount of data that's you know pounding us every single day and you know develop software and algorithms and things of that nature and the second thing was to create a dedicated team to handle all that data I meaning once we find the issues with our technology the team will review that data and then take action as needed typically the action is you know open a case with amazon and manage all the back and forth until there's a resolution so created the solution for ourselves right then what happened was we kind of told our friends from the industry that we have these capabilities so they told us help us we'll pay you and they were the early adapters and users of Gatita back in late 2015 early 2016 and over the years, the business kind of grew on itself, that solution that today we also known as Gatita, that we simply cashed out of our retail positions. This is before the beautiful exit these days. We just sold all of our inventory in the marketplaces and all the profits that we had. We kind of invested into, you know, helping other sellers with Gatita. And then our focus, our motivation, our energies kind of focused just on really helping other sellers with auditing. And things just exploded on the Gatita side and we're able kind of to take leadership position in this little niche that we're in. So hopefully that explained a little bit about the background on entrepreneurship, but also e-commerce, but also helping e-commerce sellers. That's fantastic. I mean, I've got loads of follow-up questions and to the details of what you're doing with Gatita. It's just so funny what you're saying. It's like, you know, you found something good when your friends in the industry go, oh my God, I need that. Please help me. I will pay you. If you just step in, I really need that. I feel like that's always a good value proposition and just going, all right, cool. I've really got something here. Actually, Sarah, if I can, I want to add yeah. into that because you're mentioning, you're touching a very unique point, I think with Gatita. The thing was that Gatita, the way that we're, the model works is very unique because it's free to join Gatita. It doesn't cost anything to join. And it's also free to stay with Gatita. Why? Because we only charge a fee based on recovery, meaning only if we find money and to get a recovery for our users, only then we get paid. For example, Sarah, you plug into Gatita and then the next 30 days we get you $100 in reimbursements and refunds. We charge 25%, which will be $25, right? So this is for these 30 days. The next 30 days, if we get you $0, you pay $0. So that's a very, very unique model that was very valuable for the sellers, for the users. Because of that, I guess that convenience and value proposition of the model, it was just growing over the years organically until we made a strategic decision to cash out of retail and just really being able to help sellers all over the world. Awesome. I'm excited to talk to you a little bit more about this model because it really does sound like a, you know, a fairly straightforward win for sellers, especially on something that they probably didn't realize they could get. Certainly like a nice discovery to go, wait a minute, there's like money out there that I could be claiming that I'm not claiming. I did want to ask, just jump back into your past a bit because I thought it was so interesting. Like you're talking about really kind of being like a, it feels like a day one within e-commerce and you started on eBay, you eventually got into this journey where you're scaling a business up to 20 million and I heard you say a hundred million, but talk to me about how you were in this space and, you know, reaching those milestones, especially with like that 20 million per year. What was your secret to being able to scale something like that? Right. So when I was in the mix and the craziness, I wasn't really thinking about that too much, but now I have the perspective of looking back through time. Right. The thing is that we never kind of look for that one thing that will blow us up. Looking back again, right? Back then, I didn't realize what's happening. But really today, I realized that maybe the secret, if you like, to success or the recipe for success, for me at least, right? I can only vouch for myself, was realizing or just behaving as a professional, realizing this is my profession. I'm an e-commerce seller. You know, I started as on the side because I had another profession. But it just pulled me in. And what was operating was just adding more layers of competency of knowing what to do and how to do it. So just accumulating all this experience and being comfortable with it and realizing I'm not only specializing in sourcing, I'm going to be able to basically, as an organization, it wasn't just myself. Of course, I had a partner and we built the whole team. So you create an organization, which the organization itself is a professional organization with all its departments and team members. They are all able to fulfill all these functions at the best way possible. So you got the sourcing, you got the customer service, you got the logistics, you got the finance, you got the pricing, you got, you know, like it just builds on and on. It wasn't overnight, but we're able to kind of accumulate all these layers of abilities. And that is the secret because if you kind of look at it mathematically, right? E-commerce, the way it works, at least selling on Amazon, it's not like one plus one plus one plus one equals something. Because when you add something plus something, let's say you do one plus zero plus one, 
is going to be equal to. So even if you have a zero in the middle, it's kind of okay, right? That's not how to mathematically e-commerce work as far as I understand it. It's more like a multiple. It's one times one times one times one times five, whatever. But if you have a zero somewhere in the middle, all of it will be you know, word zero. So everything in all these departments and categories need to be done very, very well. Because if not, it's going to create some sort of a discord. For example, so it could be the basics. You do market research. You know this product is hot. It sells amazing. It could sell amazing. All the data looks beautiful. But you source it. You didn't do the right quality check, for example. And the product itself is not a good product. It breaks, right? It doesn't really perform well. So you're brilliant in marketing. You're brilliant in advertising. You generate a ton of sales. But all of a sudden, the customers are not enjoying it. And you're getting negative feedback, or maybe Amazon might even block your listing, stuff like that. Because you have one zero in the middle, the whole equation turned into zero. And if sellers, whoever's listening to this, is able to realize that mathematically every department has to be done, you know, performed well, and it's a profession for everybody involved, it's not just the one thing that'll put you through the roof. Like, you know, advertising, that's it, you have a business. Or you're really good at sourcing, that's it, you have a business. It's all these departments together that have to work in synergy and synchrony in a very, very good format to build something at scale and become as successful. So hopefully... I was able to capture the essence of what I experienced looking back. Yeah, I really like that perspective, especially the way you're describing it as, you know, kind of like layering things in. I mean, obviously we work with a range of FBA sellers. Of course, a lot of people start as solopreneurs and then they graduate and they get that team. But what you were talking about is just a pretty clear cut rationale behind saying like, get those layers in, get those right teams in, because that's the only way you're going to actually be able to build and make sure that you don't end up with like a zero somewhere in your equation and make sure that something doesn't break. You really got to attack from all sides, it sounds like. So yeah, it's super interesting. I think to me, like one thing that really impresses me about what you guys do is you seem like you've mastered this kind of like a good relationship with Amazon. You've somehow befriended, I would say the beast of Amazon in a way. I say this because, you know, we talk to a lot of different people on this podcast and generally like sellers and buyers who have like a healthy skepticism for working with Amazon. It's like, oh gosh, you know, the bar for expecting Amazon to be on my side as a seller is pretty low. You know, if I go to seller support, for example, I'm not necessarily thinking that Amazon's going to be like super quick to talk to me and they're going to be on my side and they're going to just, you know, remove whatever penalty they put on my business. Like usually that's a fight. But with you guys, what I find so fascinating, and I'm just pulling a quote from your website here, you say, we maintain an agreeable, established relationship with Amazon and our dedicated case managers draw on that relationship when filing FBA reimbursement claims on your behalf. I thought that was so fascinating because to me, I was like, how in the world <laughs> did you manage to find a way to make Amazon actually work for you and develop those good relationships that so many people struggle to have? Yeah, so to be honest, it's a bit more simple than it looks from, from the sidelines. I'll unpackage this in a few ways. First thing, a big part of our team today is our former Amazon employees who used to work in, in Amazon in those departments. So oh, okay. when work, they work for us or with us, they know what they're looking for. They know how to manage all the back and forth because they used to be on the other side. Much like when you have you know, an accounting firm and then somebody work for the IRS, Internal Reverence Services in the United States, and when they want to kind of you know, look for their next path in their career, they might choose to go work for an accounting firm that they worked while they had a job back at the IRS because you know, they kind of speak the same language and they have the same flow, right? They're very used to the interaction. And then they work for the accounting firm. This interaction is just much smoother. So that's one kind of layer that we're able to establish, which just helps us to stay compliant every step of the way because a lot of it really you know it stems from decoding and analyzing amazon responses with seller support many of the sellers they feel like it's canned responses and many times they are but actually you have to read into what they're saying or trying to say so that's kind of a key very big key component because if you are you're going to be able to reply to them in a proper way they understand and you get proper resolution so language is key understanding the mindset is key decoding it is key and when you're dealing with seller support I'm going to throw this out in another direction. Also, when you're dealing with sell performance, you know, we're not sell performance specialists. That's more like the suspension like specialist. Now, using that as an example, analogy to compare, you know, when you deal with sell support, you should be able to give a proper resolution. You just have to kind of fit the mold, decode what they're trying to say, what they're trying to hear from you, and, you know, what the explanations that they're trying to get from you in order for you to reinstate the account. Well, it's much more dramatic with seller performance because it's life or death because you suspend your account. You want them to reinstate you, so you have to make this right. With us, it's not as dramatic because when we deal with Amazon, it's mostly mathematics. All Mm -hmm. we do is pretty simple. We will focus on a deficit mathematically, on a minus one. 
So we come to Amazon and say, hey, here's a minus one. Let's talk it out. What's going on? Let's investigate this because we're not demanding anything. All we're saying is we're auditors and we found a minus one and now let's reach out to the other side and communicate and let's see what happens. If Amazon provides mathematical explanation how the minus one is zero and everything's okay, no harm done, all good. If they cannot, then Amazon themselves, they say, we apologize. There's a minus one here. We do have a reimbursement policy in place. Here's the reimbursement. Now it's back to zero. Everything's good to go. And that's it. That's kind of the real, if you drill hardcore into the element, that's what's happening. And this is how it's happening on the actual functional transaction and touching with the Amazon's teams. Now, in addition to all of that, we're an authorized solution provider by Amazon. So if you visit Amazon Seller Central and there's an app store, you put Gatita there, you'll find us there. It means that we have a double commitment, basically. Of course, we have a commitment to the sellers, but we also have a commitment to Amazon to make sure that we're terms of service compliant, data security, private policy, all these components and ingredients that we have to make sure that we perform on the highest level possible. Because all we're trying to do here is just kind of help sellers audit their numbers in any deficit that we find, you know, help them to communicate that properly and efficiently with Amazon and hopefully make this whole transaction better for it and healthier and smoother for both sides. There's no friction. There's no anger. There's no motions. It's just very professional. And I would like to assume that it saves Amazon a tremendous amount of time and manpower because, you know, when we communicate with them, we know what's going on. So instead of having uh, 30 replies on a case, it could be maybe one, two, three, you're done. Or even one, two, and you're done. So then they can, you know, use your time to help other sellers because think about it for a second. If you're an Amazon seller and you open cases with seller support and they reply to you and you don't really read or care what they're saying, you reply to them, you reply and you can't get any resolution. You wasted a lot of time for them. Well, they can help another seller who understand what's going on and they can get proper resolution and move on. So we, as a solution, we definitely help in these dimensions. Therefore, when you look at the overall picture, it's just a support mechanism that we're offering here to, to help both sides. Yeah, I think that's an important distinction that you made. You're talking about the realm within which that you're talking to Amazon is a little bit less drama filled. It's less emotionally impacted the way you were talking about what is it, seller performance on the other side. So like basically, you know, don't get your wires crossed. Like where sort of the say department that you're talking to Amazon is it's just a little bit more clear cut. Like you said, it's just the numbers. I think that's important because it makes me think of what I wanted to ask you next. It's like a clear cut question if we're gonna be talking about you know, what are the benefits of seeking out reimbursements from Amazon? I think this relates to what we were just talking about, because I think there'd be a lot of people who lead in with that fear of Amazon. And they're like, well, Amazon has never been on my side before when I did X, Y, Z. Why would I expect them to be helpful or imagine that I could actually even feasibly get a reimbursement back? I don't know. I just, maybe the track record isn't great or, you know, my friends have struggled. Yeah. I'm just curious, like, what is the use case? Even when Amazon looks like the unfriendly giant, what are the benefits of actually seeking those reimbursements out for people? Got it. So this is, I guess, a good opportunity for us to segue into the world of FBA auditing and reimbursements, right? I'll give you the whole perspective. Hopefully it's useful for anybody listening. So high level, Amazon already automatically reimburses the sellers for any discrepancy that happens. But before that, I'm going to step back a little bit. Hopefully, Sarah, I'll give you the breakdown so you understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. When I, a seller, send inventory to Amazon, let's say I ship to Amazon 1,000 units, and then Amazon receives it. And instead of receiving 1,000 units, they only receive 990 units. Our technology catches that discrepancy of 10 units. The information goes to our team. We can open a case with Amazon and present that missing 10 units. Amazon will then investigate. Right. If they find them 10 missing units, great resolution. Now you, a seller, can sell those units and you're good to go. And if they don't, they're going to give you a reimbursement. Right. That's one example. More examples or issues that can happen is once your inventory is inside Amazon's fulfillment centers, inside of it, your units can get lost or damaged or destroyed or get disposed or get overcharged with fees inside. Also between the warehouses, sometimes Amazon might ship your products from Kentucky to California to Virginia to where you are, right, Sarah? And then our technology catches that. And then you have from Amazon's fulfillment center to the consumers, consumers back to Amazon with all the refunds. So all these logistic friction points, that's when all these issues occur. Now, Amazon automatically reimburses the sellers for all these discrepancies that their system automatically finds. But if you look closely into Amazon's terms of service, Amazon tells you, we're going to automatically reimburse you. We need about 30 days for that. After 30 days, it's up to you, the seller, to audit us. And if we missed anything, please open up a case, show it to us with the information, and we're going to reimburse you. So these are the rules of the game. So if for you following the rules of the game that Amazon laid out in before you, you're doing absolutely nothing wrong. If anything, you're kind of doing what they expect you to do. But when you do it, make sure you're professional about it. 
Don't just like throw numbers you don't understand and say, yeah, and, and argue and be emotional, stuff like that. That's not going to really get you anywhere. You're probably going to strain Amazon's time and, and manpower, and that's not going to reflect well on you as an organization, as a business, in your relationship with Amazon. So hopefully this kind of gives you the perspective of, of how the name of the game works, what are the expectations. And if I dive deeper into this, I can share some statistical data points. So statistically speaking, Gatito, we found that the discrepancy rate on an annual basis is between 1% to 3%, which means if you sell a million dollars in FBA, one to 3% could be 10 to $30,000 worth of discrepancies that you got to account for on a yearly basis, right? For this $30,000, potentially, maybe $5,000 was automatically given to you by Amazon, but then the rest of the 20, 25,000, you have to audit and put the work in to reconcile with them so they reimburse you, right? Another way to look at it is for every 100 units that you ship to Amazon's fulfillment centers, between one to three units is gonna experience an issue, a difficulty, a discrepancy throughout its life cycle. But Amazon created a foundational framework for you to work with to reconcile that and get a recovery. You're fully eligible for it. They're a great organization. They're willing to pay for, you know, what they owe you for any issues that it's under their responsibility and domain. You just have to be kind of a professional about it and it's all good. So what we also found is that the world of Amazon sellers are kind of split into 50-50 almost, right? 50% of the sellers are not even aware this is happening, that they're eligible, this whole name of the game, they don't even realize. So hopefully by listening to this episode only, this is valuable for you. So I salute you guys for having this show and helping sellers, you know, become better sellers, right? So there's opportunity because this is the opportunity podcast, right? So there's definitely opportunity for you, you know, take actions and help your business to get what it's owed, right? And once you get that cash flow, use it to keep growing your business. You can invest more into advertising, sourcing, launching new products. It's amazing, right? It's money that you get out of nowhere. You never imagine that it's even available there for you. The other half of the Amazon sellers are aware of it. They're kind of doing something about it. They're kind of using their own team, which is good, but they don't realize how much they can get. Like what's the maximum? Right? They might get, you know, out of thirty thousand that they're owed, they're getting ten or fifteen thousand, but there's another ten or fifteen that they can get. But it's simply you don't know what you don't know. So in situations like this, there's opportunity. And the opportunity is we can connect to solutions providers out there. It happens to be that Gatita were one of them. We're gonna come in and whatever you and your team left behind, we're gonna be able to capture that bring that value back into your pocket and only for successful doing it, only then we're going to get rewarded, right? Because we only charge a few based on success. So that's kind of the dimensions of opportunity that lays within auditing your Amazon account and getting everything that you can owe. Anybody here listening to this will know what one to 3% from the revenue, the FBA revenue means to them in potential recovery. And what's the opportunity of having that cash back in their pocket and, you know, growing their business. Yeah. That's a fantastic framework for what you're doing. Like, I think going back to your earlier point of, you know, this is the opportunity to podcast. This is a chance for people to figure out how to become better sellers and realize that there's money out there to be claiming. It's exciting. I guess from like, you know, it's not FBA related, but just a personal thing. It's like when I discovered a few years ago that, you know, if you're flying through the EU and your flight is delayed or your flight's canceled, you can go back retroactively. And there's plenty of like firms out there will do this, but you can claim money back like up to 600 euros, I think. And it's so simple. And I had no idea you could do this. And I think there was a couple of years that I was doing a lot of traveling through the EU and I was able to claim back all this money on these flights where, you know, I got screwed over when, you know, just bad airlines and bad practices. And sometimes it would take a while and I'd forget about it. And all of a sudden it's like, hey, here's 200 bucks, 400 bucks, 600 bucks. And it was great, but it was like, most people don't know that. You don't know what you don't know until unless you know the rules. And it goes back to what you're saying, like Amazon lays it out. It's right there for you. They want you to do it. You can do it, but you just got to know that the game's there in order to play it. So I think that's just one of the most interesting things that you guys are doing is you're basically saying, hey, we're here to help you. We are that person who's going to actually fight the fight for you and make sure you just get the money that you're owed because you're actually owed it. Yeah. So to add into that is, you know, sellers are really forward facing by nature. What's the next product launch, next advertising campaign, next shipment in, all that stuff. That actually creates a business. And that's what they should be doing. That's what they specialize in. Mm -hmm. And that alone is so intense. It goes back to what we're saying earlier. There's so many layers you got to perform at an amazing level, right? So in our dimension, we're looking back. No seller wants to look back and it's a given because they have to look forward, you know, having a business. So it's a perfect harmony where sellers, you know, are forward facing, they focus on what creates a business. We're like archaeologists. We always look at the past, right? We take our toothbrushes, we brush the sand. And when we find a piece of gold, we put it back in the seller's pocket and only then we get rewarded. Now, I just want to add a few elements here for people to understand. There's expiration dates for these claims. That's a very, very important thing to understand. Meaning for most part, Amazon gives up to 18 months. 
on most issues, not all issues, to get your money and your reimbursement. After that, the eligibility expires forever. So our mission is quite simple when we drill it down to the core, making sure that you get the maximum FBA reimbursement that you're eligible to receive. Because if you don't, you lose two things. First thing you lose is your investment, the money you invest into the inventory. But the second thing that you lose is your profit. And why? Because when Amazon pays a reimbursement, they're actually amazing. They're really, really fair. They pay you, the seller, as if you sold that unit on Amazon. So we're shifting a double negative into a double positive. You get your money back and you make profit because you you know you make all the margin. Essentially, Amazon is buying that inventory off your hand at retail price. And that's a huge impact on a positive side for the sellers. So there's a creation date. Make sure that we're there to make sure that it never expires and everything that's eligible, you get it back. And that kind of empowers you to, to have a healthy, uh, long-term business. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic point. Like you said, it's like, you know, you got to be moving forward as a business owner. You might not have all the energy for looking back and that's okay. You got to find the right partners who can do that because you, you know, obviously can claim a lot from being able to do that. I just wanted to get into some of the nuts and bolts of what you're doing. You've probably hinted on this somewhat, but I just want to kind of walk through the framework so that people have a really clear sense of understanding the reimbursement process. So if you could just kick it off first, what are the different types of reimbursement say people should know or expect? Right. So yeah, like you mentioned, we touched it, but I'm going to reframe it. There's inbound reconciliation as you ship your units to Amazon and where they receive it. This is kind of the entry level. And then once the units are inside the warehouse and between the warehouses and between the warehouses to the consumers, consumers back to Amazon, you got all these logistical friction points. These friction points are lost, damaged, destroyed, disappeared, disposed, or got overcharged with fees. So you take these five, six elements across five or six friction points, it adds to like 30 plus, right? So that's kind of the body of it. In addition to that, I'll give one more layer of example of discrepancy, which is less on the logistical side, it's more on the financial side, right? So this discrepancy is actually limited to 90 days. You only have 90 days worth of recovery. After 90 days, it expires. It's called overcharges of fulfillment fees. Because when Amazon charges you a fulfillment fee, and what is a fulfillment fee? You sold your item. When you sell your item, Amazon is going to pick it from a bin. They're going to package it in a box and they're going to ship it out and they're going to charge you a fee for that, a fulfillment fee. And the amount of fee that they're going to charge you is based on the weight and dimension of that product. So if Amazon has incorrect data of the weight and dimension of your product, meaning they think it's much heavier and larger than it actually is, they're going to overcharge you. For example, they're supposed to charge you three and a half dollars every time they fulfill an order for you. But instead of that, their data is incorrect. So they're overcharging you and they're charging you $10 every time you sold an order and they fulfill it for you. So here the financial overcharge is $6.5 per unit. You sold 1,000 units, it's $6,500 that they overcharge you in fees. Wow. That's another layer. That's kind of the main bodies of things. There's other variations and nuances of kind of the same things. Much like maybe if I can borrow, humbly borrow from Corona, you had the first Corona, then you had the Delta, you got the Omicron, kind of the same genetics, but a variation. But for the most part, I think that kind of touches the body of things, the inbound, what's happening inside the warehouses, and also the financial discrepancies. Another small variation or weird variation could be like maybe Amazon did approve to pay you $100 in a reimbursement. And they even give you a reimbursement ID number, but lo and behold, it never got processed for whatever glitch in the system. This is more of a technical discrepancy, right? But on the financial side, I don't want to you know, put all the laundry list out, but I think I touched the main elements to walk through the logic of what's going on and what sellers should be looking for. But now I'm going to wrap it up with numbers. So the fulfillment fees overcharges, you got 90 days that you can look back. With inbound shipments, when you ship your inventory to Amazon, you got six months to reconcile. After six months, no eligibility left. And then all the stuff that happens inside the warehouse with all the loss, damage, dispose, refunds, all that stuff, you got about 18 months, which is kind of generous. By the way, it used to be that all types of them, like almost all of them, were 18 months. And over the years, Amazon just narrows it down. Even mm-hmm. the fulfillment fees overcharges used to be 18 months. All of a sudden, one quick day, boom, it's 90 days. Wow. That actually just reinforced the need of the sellers to get support with this because they can't keep it up on time. So there's the solution providers were able to say, hey, we're actually here for you because we'll help you scale. So you make sure we do this for you you know, on time, every time with no fail because it's all we do. We don't play sports. We don't sell on Amazon. We don't do real estate. This is all we do. This is kind of what we live for. So that's our pleasure to come and have the opportunity to assist the sellers. Inbound shipments, when you ship your products to Amazon, it used to be 18 months, then nine months. Late last year, I think October, November last year, they cut it down to six months. So looking to the future, Amazon is just going to make 
the sellers realize that they have less of a time frame to deal with all these discrepancies. So they're better, once again, become professional players and keep up to the game. And of course, if it's too much of a challenge, sellers don't know even where to start, reach out for solution providers. They're definitely out there. We happen to be one of them. But you know, this is just one function out of many, many variations of functions that sellers need to do and perform well and master you know, to make their business successful. Yeah, it's wild to hear that and not surprising for Amazon, right? That, you know, it used to be a bit more generous and all of a sudden, boom, one major cut and we're down to a fraction of what you were offered. So certainly a good scenario as to why you would need to get in and get help to actually manage this. I mean, again, we have talked about it some, but it's still nice to have like a clear cut A to Z. What are the steps that Amazon sellers need to follow in order to apply for reimbursement? And how long does that process take? Got it. So it all depends on the type of claim that you're handling. I'll try to touch the three layers that are kind of getting brought. Inbound shipments, if you're listening to this, all you got to do is go to Amazon Seller Central, go to Inventory, manage FBS shipments, and all of a over there, you're going to see the shipment log. You're just going to see all the shipments that you shipped, and you're going to see how much you shipped and how much received. It's in the columns. All you got to do is use your eyes when you see, oh, I shipped a thousand here. They only received 190. Log in, click that shipment, go inside. Inside of that shipment, there's a module for reconciliation that Amazon has built inside. So over there, you're going to be able to say, hey, there's missing 10 units. You know, there's a drop down menu. Click please research and submit. As simple as that, right? It's in the framework of Amazon. Mm -hmm. That's why it goes back to the question. Does, you know, are you going to get in trouble with Amazon? No, it's in their system. Just use the system. Use the flow. They create a flow for you to use. Use it. You're doing absolutely nothing wrong, right? The buttons are there for you in that vehicle to use, right? It's like, I don't know if I should use an air conditioner in my car. I don't know if the manufacturer wants me to use it or not. The manufacturer actually <laughs> created an air conditioner for you. There's a buttons there. When it's hot, put the cold. When it's cold, put hot. Same idea here, right? Get your money back. <laughs> Guys, you can get your money back. <laughs> yeah, reconcile shipment. It's pretty routine in any business when it involves fulfillment. You receive your inventory from the supplier. It can be maybe from overseas. Guess what? They short shipped you. You're going to reconcile that. And then you're going to communicate. And then they're going to credit you. Or if you, maybe you'll find it. That's how it all works. So Amazon created the same flow. Or I guess the same relationship on a massive, massive scale with millions of sellers worldwide. And that's the system and the flows that they created. So that's the inbound shipments. Now, when we're dealing with loss and damage inventory inside Amazon's fulfillment centers, that's where, honestly, that's when things become a bit dicier and more complex and more professional. I'm going to hint the logic. If it's too much, you can call me and say, no, I'm getting dizzy. You only stop. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Just let me know. So essentially, to skimp it simple, Amazon tells you, you need to download three types of reports before you open a claim with us. Meaning they expect you to investigate, and this is how you investigate. Download three types of reports right, from three different data sets. And the first report, you're going to look for all the transactions of the lost unit. Right? So in the one file, you're going to find all the units that got lost in the past 18 months. The second file, you're going to look for if that unit was found. If it's found, no further action needed. If it wasn't found, they tell you go to the third report. And the third report, look if we already automatically reimburse you. Because if we did, no further action needed. If we did not, then yes, you're welcome to open a case. And once again, I repeat, first report, find what's lost. Second report, see if it's found. If it's not, go to the third report. Third report, see if it got paid already, got reimbursed. If, and if it didn't, then open up a case. We'll investigate further for you. Okay? And that's how it works on the loss and damage units in the past 18 months. Second layer. Okay, third layer is, I can't bring everything, but I'm going to be the main ones, right? Third layer is the fulfillment fees overcharges. Pretty straightforward. You, as a seller, you need to know your own winning dimensions for every product. So use your data. And then you're going to go to Amazon Sell Essential. You're going to go to Report, Fulfillment. On the left-hand side of the bar over there, you're going to see a fulfillment fees preview. You download that report, and over there, you're going to be able to see the winning dimensions that Amazon has for each of your products. Okay, so basically, you compare between your data and Amazon's data, and you cross-reference it. And when you find that Amazon, for any of your items, has incorrect data, basically, the data suggests that the products are actually larger or heavier than they actually are, boom, you found the discrepancy. You open a case with Amazon, and you got to accomplish two things. First thing, make sure they fix it. So moving forward, they charge you the correct amount of fees. And then the past 90 days, whatever they overcharge you, you get a recovery for that. So hopefully that gives you enough body guys to take some actions and actually have this interview and this episode financial rewarding for you. And of course, too much, reach out. We'll be happy to help further if you need it. Yeah. I mean, just in light of everything you're saying, and I know we're talking about a lot of complexities and numbers and, you know, kind of things all over the place. But to take a step back, and maybe this feels like an obvious question, but I think it's worth asking, what could claiming reimbursement do for your business in the long run? Oh, yeah. I love that question. So by the way, to segue into that question, once you open a case with Amazon, they're going to look and review the data if they just approve your claim. What they're going to do is they're going to give you a reimbursement ID and they're going to add funds into your Amazon Sell Essential account. And when they pay you, they usually pay every two weeks, that's where you get the funds in your pocket. That's the flow on the financial side. 
as per your question was, remind me again, just to make sure I get this on the right spot. Yeah. So what could claiming reimbursement do for businesses in the long run? Got it. So once you get that money from Amazon and then effectively what's happening, like I mentioned earlier, you get the cost of goods back. Let's say they lost $10,000 worth of your inventory and your cost of goods for that $10,000 was 2000 So you got your investment back and then that $8,000 goes straight into your bottom line. All of a sudden you're making profit. You're making all the profit that you're supposed to be making. So long term, you have a healthy business because if you don't, you lose the investment and the profit. In other words, you're not maximizing the full potential of your business. And especially if you never did this before, all of a sudden you're going to, you know, you never audited your account. You never got everything that you owed. We're going to go back 18 months and you're going to flush your business with all this money you never expected to have. And in that case, it's pure juice. It goes straight to your bottom line, straight to your EBITDA, your earnings before interest, tax and amortization. So that's great. It gives you a lift to the bottom line. Let me just take a small financial example here, okay, just to see the impact, if I may. Mm -hmm. You did a million dollars a year in revenue, FBA. Your net margin is 10%, right? So you made $100,000. The discrepancy rate, like I mentioned, it could be 1% to 3% from your annual sales. So in this case, if you're doing a million, that could be 10 to 30,000, okay? Let's be conservative. You're able to add another 10,000 worth of you know reimbursements. Instead of 30,000, let's be only take only 10,000. Mm-hmm. So you got 1% back because 10,000 is only 1% from the million. But now it take that 1%, which is 10,000, and add it to your net profit, which was 100,000. So 10,000 added to 100,000 is a boom, is a 10% lift in your net profit, 10%. Wow. You did nothing. You didn't pay any extra dollar to advertise anything. You did not launch a new product. You didn't hire any employee, nothing. You went back on your own data and you discovered opportunity there to get something that was you know, you're eligible to receive. And that boosted your bottom line by 10%. So it's one of the surest, quickest, most proven track record ways of increasing your profit just like that. Boom. It's amazing, right? Now, another thing is, and maybe it kind of connects to what you guys are trying to help with sellers. If you're selling an Amazon business, because when you're selling an Amazon business, you're selling your profit. Whoever's buying your business is buying your profit and paying you a multiple. So if your profit is $100,000 and now maybe they either they want to give you a 7x multiple for your business. So they want to give you 700000 But all of a sudden you're able to go back 18 months because you're about to sell, right? And you're able to add another $10,000 in profit to your business because of reimbursements. All of a sudden you time that 10,000 times seven. So you're getting $70,000 boom on your way out, out of nowhere. Right. So that's a further financial positive impact for your business if you maximize and optimize through auditing. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly where my head was thinking as you're talking about that. And thanks for drawing the connection there between what you're doing and what we're doing. But yeah, we, we talk to sellers all the time. It's like, okay, if you're in that exit planning process, you know, that year or two leading up to exit, where's the money that you could be adding to your ultimate valuation? Like what are the ways that you could be getting stuff back? And people, I think you might get a little bit flustered figuring out where do we start turning over every stone and figure out where the efficiencies are? And if you don't know that you've got this option to just pretty fairly easily add that one to 3%, like you're missing out on what's something that could be huge, huge for you and your exit and your business. So, you know, again, it's just fantastic what you guys are doing. I think relate to an earlier point that you made. I really like the way you said, you know, you're supposed to be looking forward as a business owner and not always looking back and like you need help to be able to like go back retroactively and go after some of these discrepancies, things that might've gone wrong that Amazon did to help you move forward. But it's just a matter of like where it is you're moving towards as an entrepreneur and you are helping businesses not have to get stuck trying to go back retroactively and clean up messes and get the money that they're owed. So I think it's like, if we're talking about what businesses are doing in the long run, there's obviously the scenario that you're talking about where you're you're walking away with a ton of money. But at the same time, it's just kind of like, it's a directional thing. It's like keeping your head in the right place to order really like move forward and move correctly in your business versus like cleaning up fires like you shouldn't be cleaning up. Right. Okay. So, you know, in light of all this, Yoni, you're talking a lot about kind of what's going on in the reimbursement landscape. But talk to me about what your take is on the Amazon landscape today. What would you say are the biggest pain points for sellers? You know, I know we're in a lot of pain points, right? We've got shipping crisis, pandemic changes, inventory limits, whatever. What are you seeing going on right now that you think that sellers really need to be paying attention to? Inflation. Inflation is something mm. that didn't really happen in the United States economy. It did happen in other places in the world, but in the United States economy since the late 70s, early 80s. So really our generation, including myself, I'm in my late 30s, 
We never experienced it. So all these successful Amazon e-commerce businesses were having an amazing time if, you know, when they reached success. But now it's kind of new dimension when like an unknown territory because they say that inflation is like a beast. Once it's out of the cage, it's hard to tame it and being able to put it back in because it's coming from all these directions. Right. It's like a domino effect. It hits here and then it hits there and then it's there. So you're pulling, you know, turning out down all these fires, but it still comes around. So all these cost structures that they had in the past are changing. Let's start from a few elements. Sourcing. Right, it's necessarily for sourcing from overseas. Manufacturing costs has risen. Right, they have labor issues. They have their own infl- you know, raw materials issues or all that stuff. So your cost of sourcing the goods and sorry, producing the goods increase. Now you got logistics. All this global logistics, you know, bottlenecks. Once again, when your inventory is stuck in the container at sea in the port of Los Angeles, you know, waiting to get in, it's not free. Every day that's stuck out there costs you storage fees on these containers or removing fees, whatever it is. So boom, your costs all of a sudden are up. Right. And then you have your own team that you hire. It can be even a remote team or in-house team. They probably want to get more because the labor market is very tight. Job market is very, very good. People having jobs and companies have to kind of compete for top talent. Right. And pay more for it. So everywhere you look, your costs are increasing. The problem is, Sarah, on the marketplace, everybody's competing to have the lowest price possible. Because right. all of a sudden you're going to increase your prices. You might lose your rank on Amazon. And you have to because you're, for now you're going to be profitable. And if what if the other players... They have more capacity, they have better margin because when they're sourcing it, they also have price increases. But ultimate numbers, they have lower numbers than you. They're doing things at scale. They can buy, you buy a million dollars a year in worth of inventory, they buy a hundred million a year. And the price per unit for them will be dramatically lower, right? And they have better rates with container ships and stuff like that, better agreements, better relationships. You understand? So things of that nature have, that's done in scale for professional, well-established companies that have a track record of dealing with this, they're going to be much more immune and they have a better advantage on surviving all these challenges. So that's kind of the elements that many of the sellers are experiencing. Another, I'll throw another point into the mix here, the aggregators. A lot of aggregators are buying all these businesses and they're essentially become these big corporations that hopefully will become, you know, some of them will be knocked out probably or have major challenges, but the ones who prevail these challenges will be the pure, true corporations in the e-commerce space. They are the highest professional level grade of corporations that are resilient. They have the playbook. They're SOP because they're experienced in non-inflationary times. They survived inflationary times and they did it at scale and they stayed profitable. So it's going to be very interesting to see looking to the future who's going to survive, who's going to dive and you know who comes on top. That's excellent. I mean, you've really painted a good picture there of obviously the challenges, but even getting into like the future and who's going to be the biggest players, what things might look like. I mean, do you have any ideas of like what you think the future is going to be like for Gatita? Oh, for us, our focus, for the most part, we always kind of try to focus, much like Amazon, honestly. You know, Amazon is customer-centric, as they should be. We're very seller-centric, so we keep our eyes and ears with the seller. What is are the challenges? And we can identify a true opportunity for us to help him in a way that probably hopefully never done before, or even if done before, we could be done on a much more impactful level. We're just going to open up into that. But for the most part, we'll try to have it in our wheelhouse. So what happens is sometimes a seller will come to us and say, yo, Gatita, check this out. Look what happened. And we we'll say, yeah, please do show us. They show us something that we've never seen before and basically a new variation, a type of discrepancy we've never seen before. So we get excited. We help them solve this challenge. And if we're successful in solving this challenge, what we're going to do, we're going to take that new type of discrepancy. We're going to scan it throughout a whole user base and all of a sudden they're going to get rewarded. In other words, when you use Gatita, you have a built-in R&D, research and development mechanism that works in your favor. So look into the future. Hopefully that system will keep you know, finding new opportunities to reward and help the sellers. So they're just going to be more of a positive impact for them in the future. Awesome. Well, it's great. I mean, it's cool to think about where you guys are going and I mean, obviously offering a lot to sellers today. So I appreciate getting a picture of what you're doing at Katita. We like to close these things out with a couple rapid fire questions. If you're cool with that, we can move on to the first one. Yeah, go ahead. Cool. All right. So what's your take on the best hidden growth opportunities within Amazon FBA? Amazon on FBA growth opportunities is pandemic has threw a lot of new users into Amazon. A lot of them are of a higher age, you know, maybe 50 years old or and up, six years old and up. And I don't think there's enough data right now out there as compared to other categories. So, you know, trial and error, try to see if you can accommodate and create products that are unique to them because they're new to the platform and they're browsing and you have an opportunity to hit them, you know, a cater to them. And if they're 60 years old plus and they're sitting at home, they can't really move anywhere because of the pandemic, but they have money in their pockets. 
and have full intent to buy, you might find really good conversions there. So maybe there's an opportunity in tapping into that market. There's no data yet. That's why it's kind of a scoop almost because many sellers are using tools to do market research. It's all based on data that's already of the past, which is cool. You should do that. But look into the future. If you can really use common sense logic, there's layers and layers of new users on Amazon. Many of them are not catered fully to their needs. So definitely opportunity there. Great. Awesome. That's a good one. What about the best tools or resources that can help people optimize the Amazon reimbursement process? Honestly, if you visit our website, Gatita, we have a very, very rich catalog of blog articles. You can tap into that. We have a YouTube channel. We have a podcast show. And it shows like this, honestly. You know, the Opportunity Podcast with Empire Flippers. So there's a lot of rich content out there that just gives you the insight, gives you the ability to at least get going. And of course, use social media. There's a lot of groups. And reach out to people. Don't be shy. We act as a community. So if you ever want to reach out to me, actually, to learn more, I'm a resource. Just hit me on Facebook, on LinkedIn, whatever it is. And I'll be happy to answer any kind of challenges or issues that you're still experiencing. Because yeah, even though it sounds like it's a big, 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 it's still a tight knit community where everybody's kind of here to help each other. So do not be shy, reach out. And that's kind of the available resources. Great. No, I love that. Thanks for the plug about the opportunity too. But going through y'all's resources, uh, you certainly have some great stuff around Gatita. So I think people will be well served when they start getting into it. Final question. One of my favorite ones. What has been your funniest moment working within Amazon? Got it. So I'll give one example where now I take it in humor. So when I was still selling on Amazon, I don't sell on Amazon anymore. We used to sell jewelry. So we actually tried to um, like a new factory and we got a sample of ring, right? And the ring was supposed to be very, very durable. So we said, okay, let's go test it. You know, we got the sample, we go outside to test it. So what we tried to do is really throw it on the ground as hard as possible, see if it, you know, for breaks and shatters. So we did that. Only problem is we were in, in our offices, we have beautiful like windows, you know, like window, like everything was made out of glass. So lo and behold, unfortunately, the quality wasn't good and it shattered the ring. And one of the ricochets hit one of the glass doors over there and the whole thing shattered completely. What? So that little, <laughs> yeah, that little experiment cost us a lot of money. We had to replace the whole thing. It was a whole fiasco. So lesson here is that when you do a quality check and trying to break things around, you know, uh, fragile things like windows and stuff like that and uh, glass, stay away. Just don't do it there. That's kind of a takeaway. But that was a funny moment. I paid for it, but it was funny looking back. Uh, I mean, did you manage to like record yourself while doing that? No, no, I, I had no idea. We hope it's not going to break. So no issue, but it did break and <laughs> it broke so violently. It just a small little thing, like a bullet, it, like flew in, into the glass and just shattered it completely. We were like, our job, like what just happened here? This was not supposed to be like this. And it was just funny. Oh my God. Yeah. In my head, I see that like visually, it would have been an amazing video, like how not to do Amazon quality checks less than 101. (laughs) It's so fresh and green. It was hilarious. That's amazing. That's such a good one. Cool. Well, Yoni, this has been a lot of fun having you on. I'm really excited for all the sellers listening to this who are probably like day made realizing they've got a lot of money waiting for them right now. So thank you so much for coming on and sharing such valuable information with our audience. If anyone wants to get in touch with you, where they can they find you? Got it. So you can email me directly. My email is yonim at gatita.com. Yoni is Y for Yankee, O for Oscar, N for Nancy, I for Indiana, M for Mama at gatita.com. Gatita is G-E-T-I-D-A, which is G for Gina, E for Echo, T for Tango, I for Indiana, D for Delta, A for Alpha.com. So yonim at gatita.com. If you want, I can throw in an offer for the listeners of this podcast if you want. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So if you visit uh, gatita.com forward slash opportunity, I'll make sure this happens. We'll give you $400 of free reimbursements. So it's a guarantee. You're going to have 400 bucks more in your pocket. So you're going to register Gatita. We're going to get you $400 in you know, reimbursements. It might take us a day or a few weeks, but that's a guarantee. After $400, if you want to leave us, you can leave. If you want to stay, that's fine as well. Hopefully that will be a little bit even more useful for the listeners. Awesome. Wow. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Yoni. Yeah. We'll include it in the show notes as well for people to be able to find it. But yeah. Hey, free money, people. Go for it. (laughs) Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Yoni, for coming on. It's been a lot of fun and looking forward to seeing what happens for Katita this year. Thank you so much, everybody. Best of luck. Awesome. Thank you. everyone. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you've walked away with a bit of new insight that'll help you in your digital entrepreneurship journey. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating review. To learn more about businesses available for sale at Empire Flippers, click the link in the description or visit empireflippers.com slash marketplace. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.